to my office here at the CBS News Broadcast Center in New York. Can you name this city? It should be painfully obvious. We're getting a live feed into the building right now. If you can't figure it out, I'll tell you at the end of the video. And yes, you may see a difference in my office from the last video I posted from here. Sure, there's a few boxes that still need to be unpacked. I'll get to it. But the pictures are up. These are all snapshots I took from my uh, two-year adventure with CNN hosting Inside Africa. I had such memorable moments and things that changed my life. I will share with you the stories behind these pictures one by one, because really there are so many stories to tell. Um, but just quickly to share with you what I thought were some of the more remarkable moments I experienced this week as an anchor and as a reporter. The standout moments were both at the anchor desk. One of the major stories that hit this week was abortion. Arizona's state Supreme Court made a ruling that effectively reenacted a law from 1864. They said it still stands, which restricts abortion in all cases, except when the mother's life is at risk. It's a heavy issue. I was able to interview the attorney general of the state, about her outrage over that ruling, her commitment, she says to women and doctors that they won't be prosecuted under this law, and how it may change the calculation in what is a purple swing state ahead of November's presidential election. I went to high school in Arizona. My mom lives there. I've got so many friends there, and I know that this is a topic that people have strong opinions about, even if they feel that it doesn't affect them directly. And she had a lot to say. I'll certainly include the link in this video so you can see that interview. Absolutely. And, you know, you're right. I won my my election by 280 votes and I won because I believe because uh, of the Dobbs decision and because so many independents and Republicans were outraged by the decision of the United States Supreme Court to deprive American women of the right to uh, control their own bodies. And so the other standout moment was, as is always the case, when you anchor a program, breaking news can happen at any moment on any topic and you have to roll with it. This week, it was the death of O.J. Simpson. That was announced by his family moments before we were preparing to go to air. And I was way too young at the time to really have a direct memory of watching the trial and understanding what it meant to the country. Absolutely. Since then, I've learned that. But in covering the death of O.J. Simpson and how divisive he was and how divisive that moment was in the early 90s when he was acquitted. But we were able to speak with a number of people with some real insight. Carl Douglas was a member of the Dream Team. That was the nickname given to O.J. Simpson's legal defense. And I spoke with him about how he felt the moment the verdict came in. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant or job. Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187. Take us back to that moment. Where were you if you were in the room? And did you believe that would be the verdict? I was sitting inside the well right by the swinging door, right in back of Lee Bailey, who was at the front desk. And let me tell you, I've only cried out of joy two times in my life, once when my son was born and second at the O.J. Simpson verdict that day, because that was for us as trial lawyers, the culmination of 16 months of effort, day in, day out, Saturday, Sunday, evening, and for a trial lawyer to have success in their effort vindicating the time and the effort that we nine lawyers expended away from our families, away from our law practices, was in fact a great, a great victory for trial lawyers everywhere. It we also spoke with a reporter who was flying the news helicopter at the time of the infamous Bronco chase. Zoe Tur was with a local station at the time and shared with us how they were able to figure out, along with police, where OJ was when he didn't show up as expected at the police station. I looked down you know, through the chin bubble right below, and there was a white Bronco, and I, I couldn't believe it. And then to confirm that it was OJ, the first sheriff's unit arrived, the second, the third, the fourth, flip of the switch, we were on, you know, the air live with close to 100 million viewers. 
around the world watching this this spectacle uh, start, you know. And, and Zoe didn't hold back how she feels about OJ. She said good riddance, certainly symbolic of the many people who believed OJ killed his wife and her friend and do think that he got away with murder and don't feel that his life needs to be honored in any way. And that divide in America between people who were joyous over his acquittal and people who felt absolutely insulted by it was why another person we spoke with, I think, was key. Lori Levinson teaches at Loyola Law School. So this is a woman who in the present day still speaks about the O.J. Simpson case and the subsequent legal problems he had. And she teaches her students about what it means in America and what it means as far as the legal system. I'm including links to all these videos. But one of the things that I found interesting that she shared with us is that O.J. Simpson was found guilty in 2008. And she believed there was a connection between the early 90s acquittal and the guilty verdict on this completely separate and apart case, even though they legally had nothing to do with each other. She does feel there is some type of connection. Watch the video to see what that was exactly. And that was stunning to me because, look, I have no personal memory of the O.J. Simpson trial. I was too young. My family had just moved to the United States. So I was more likely fascinated by basketball, fascinated by American foods, American music, and just kind of having an enjoyable time as a kid. But obviously, as I've grown up and O.J. Simpson and that trial has become ubiquitous in American culture, I've learned about what it meant, what happened before it, the Rodney King beating, why the racial climate in Los Angeles was so fragile. And quite frankly, just looking around at everything, it's clear that many of those issues aren't resolved to this day. And that little story, I think, better personifies the point I'm trying to make overall which is that when it comes to high-profile murder cases especially, none of us can actually say definitively what happened. We have to do what prosecutors and defenders do, piece together the evidence, piece together testimony, and then, as juries do, use your own common sense in coming to a conclusion that's most likely. And I think that's why the O.J. Simpson trial is so divisive and why people have such strong opinions on every aspect of his life. And it's because it's representative of how you see issues like celebrity, wealth, power, influence, corruption, racism, division, whatever your opinions are on those topics, likely fuse and inform what you think of O.J. Simpson and what he did and didn't do. Just remarkable. It's, a, it's another moment where I'm thankful of the role I have and the privilege I have in sometimes just being dumb and not knowing things, and getting to speak with experts or people who were there, but still understanding that people are sharing both the factual information and their opinions with you. Just another eye-opening week for me where you never know what to expect or what big stories will drop into your lap. All right, that's it for now. I got to get out of here. It's getting late. And obviously, this is Seattle. Come on now. Space Needle. Space Needle. Come on. Thanks for watching. See you next time.